Hey, you're watching GearWire.com. I'm Owen O'Malley. We're at the Win booth here uh, with Win founder uh, Randy Fulmer and James Lomenzo of Megadeth. Thank Hi. you for joining us. Very nice to be here today at the NAMM show, Saturday. Yes, it's at Saturday. At the fabulous Win booth. So uh, talk to us how you found out about uh, about Win Guitars. Well, a very good friend of mine, CJ, who's milling about here somewhere, um, actually worked along with Randy at his former occupation, yeah. which I think I should give that up completely. Oh. I wouldn't do that anymore if I were you. <laughs> and um, I guess they, they uh, crossed, paths, crossed paths recently, and they kind of caught up as you do. And um, Randy Randall told CJ that he was actually exploring a passion that he had right now, which was to make bass guitars, yes. among other things. But um, we'll just talk about bass guitars today. Um, and so he said, why don't you come up? CJ is a dear friend of mine and a, a great bass player in his own right. And so he immediately knew that this is the kind of thing that I was into. So after he found out what Randall was up to, went over there and he immediately got me on the phone. And he said, you got to see this stuff. This is that, that quality tonewood stuff that you and I both love. And um, it's made hand by, uh, piece by piece by hand by a true artisan. And I was like, okay, now that you're finished pulling my leg, what, you know, what's the pitch? And I actually, I, I spoke with Randall on the phone and then actually went down and, and met with him and, and saw his operation, expansive. Yes, it's a, it's, I, I own seven forests. That's right. And, um, and we found out not only was he legit, but he was kind of a mad scientist in that he's totally and unabashedly um, in, engulfed in this notion of making these bases each have a personality, each have their own style, each have a visual personality. And um, so, bravely, I don't know why you even, but okay. He said, let me make you whatever you want. And so um, he goes, what's your favorite bass? And I said, well, it's that, it's that really ugly looking thing that John Nentwistle made years ago, the Warwick Company made called a, a buzzer bass. And he said, well, come on, bring it by and let's, let's take a look at it and see what you like about it. And, and so, took copious measurements up and down the neck, which I do love that neck, um, looked at the general construction of it, looked at the body design, tried to figure out why it was designed like that and why it would even work for me. And we both came to the conclusion that the folly of that instrument was that for my frame, it was always a bit lar larger than I need to yeah. play. Either, so, either you had to grow seven inches or we had to make a smaller base. Yes, and I've been, my whole life has been all about growing seven <laughs> inches and this is all I got. Sorry. Heels, lifts, I was talking about shoes. Shoes. Yeah, okay. shoes. So, um, of course, looking at these bases, that gives me the, no, okay. So, anyway, what ended up happening? You were talking about exotic wood? I think we were. <laughs> That's nasty, young man. What? Put that thing away. Okay, so now that we'll get off penises for a minute, back to bases. <laughs> Boys, I know, boys. Uh, so anyway, what ended up happening was Randall, Randall took some uh, measurements of the instruments I had sat on me and actually went on and discussed with CJ the types of instruments that I liked. And it was really funny because in my estimation, I don't know if that's what you're going for, but, but it, it's a weird amalgam. The body of, of, of that bass is, is a weird amalgam of, of, of uh, uh, an, an old Alembic style on parts of it. Um, certainly that Warwick Buzzard style and yeah. some of the Warwick Thumb style in a way. Not, I mean, none of it is that bass completely, but there are just little elements of it that kind of look familiar you to me. You make it sound like I put a great deal of thought into it. I love that. <laughs> well, like I'm saying, you know, this is, this is my, my initial response to, to looking at it. So anyway, um, there, again, Randall's one of these great guys who, who, who just obsesses. Yeah, that's right? true. Absolutely. And I think for a luthier, that's that's a that's a really esteemed way to look at things. That's you know that it shows a level of, of art artistic care that you know don't really necessarily find in, in the guitar world you know in mass. So anyway, slowly as I was on the on the road, well, I, I left off that day, and he said, "All right, let me make this, just like that," you know. <laughs> and then all Got of a it. sudden, these weird emails were showing up. And there was something that looked like a can opener beak, and he said, "Well, this is this is going to be your uh, headstock." And I said, "Okay, good." And <laughs> the next part was one of the bodies, and uh, he said, "I've got this, this project I'm doing right now, and I, I, I rather like carving things. So do you mind if I carve it?" And I didn't know exactly what he was talking about, but I was like, "Yeah, I don't carve, you know, carve, buff, whatever you need to do." And so. Um, it, Within two months, I think. Yeah, yeah, it went really fast. You're insane. I thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so do you sort of, you know, come up with these, you know, wild ideas and then just pray to God that uh, you, you know the, your artist is uh, is cool with the with the ideas? 
I, well, I like to check in, but he he kept saying yes. I yes. don't know if he meant yes or not. But no, he absolutely yes. <laughs> yes. The the interesting thing is though, if you look at most of the guitars in this booth, most of the models that he makes, they're all of similar shape and size. So I had, I mean, I was bowled over the fact that he could take he, he could take the wood that he was working with with all these guitars and just totally deform it yeah. to this vision that you know <laughs> that I wanted to. And it's really an amazing. It's it's a testimony, an amazing. Um, um, testimony to his skill and his craft. I think you just said the guitar is totally deformed. It so is totally <laughs> compared to these nice soft designs that you have. Yeah. In, the, in the best way. In the best possible way. In the best way. way. Well, exactly. Yeah. Well, I have a distortion unit. I don't yeah. always use a distortion <laughs> unit, but sometimes people have to go, ah! <laughs> and I think that I think we've got the perfect uh, yes. balance of a yes. great instrument and ah! <laughs> now, did you have a specific idea of like a, a tone that you wanted? Did you get a specific as you? I asked him specifically, and this is actually a very important point that you that you touched on. I said to Randy, the thing that I liked about some of the basses that I used was the hardwood tone would really um, embellish the high end, the harmonics, bring all of that out, and the percussiveness. And I was really into maintaining that, and you can take that away because he knew exactly what to do. Well, so we, we put on an ebony fretboard, yeah. and, ebon, and I, then I decided graphically it would look fantastic with an ebony stripe all the way down the middle of the guitar. And putting an ebony stripe down the body uh, in the middle would be very percussive and bright when, when, with slapping and, uh, and, and playing. So it just was, it seemed like the right thing to do graphically and from a sound standpoint. And then I used Wenge, which is a favorite wood uh, of James's as well, for the neck. So I knew that it would have a dark, throaty, deep bass sound and not be and, and co contrasted with the brightness of the ebony. Yeah. It does sound great. I mean, in the chords and everything, it's very clear, but it's still huge and it's piano like sometimes, but, yeah. but aggressive still. It sounds really great. It has, I've, I've been playing it nonstop. It's actually an obsession of mine now. And, and um, it, it just has so many varieties and so many layers of tone. Depending on, um, even all on its own, if you just put it in the passive mode, you just kind of hit it one way and hit it another, move your hand up and down the neck, it has all these voices that you can you can access immediately just by touching it. That's an amazing feat. And then having the, uh, there's a Nordstrand pickups Nordstrand. on there, having that system on there, which, which has such a diversity of EQ built into it automatically, and being able to sweep between the front and the back pickup, it's almost unlimited. I mean, what you can come up with. I mean, I can zap from a Motown vibe. Easy. I've put this on a uh, digital recording lately just to see what it's got. You could go down to a Motown thing. You can do a sub bass thing, and you can do the piano strings. You can, you know, totally come up with a really destroyed, rectified waveform if you really like. If you hit it hard enough. Giving away all your other basses now. I couldn't possibly do that, but this. <laughs> but uh, you know what? I like to watch them sit in the corner and weep these days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Honestly. Yeah. So I noticed that, that hip shot uh, detuner on there. Um, is uh, is that because you hate five strings? So, no, I don't. I don't hate five strings. As a matter of fact, I like his five strings better than most. Oh, right. Um, I've only seen a few five strings that, in my estimation, kind of measure up in that they're even from top to bottom. And um, all of Randy's five strings are really consistent, which I really love. Um, but no, I, I just um, viscerally, I like the feel of a four string. And you know, I like to have that space to move on the E string and use it percussively. When you have the when you have a really light B string and you set up the pickups as close as I do, you tend to um, have to protect that B string from getting out from under. You know, you basically like uh, monitor it, so it's not vibrating sympathetically. So that's just one other thing I don't really like to think about. So I like to have the D tuner to just be able to to drop it down and get the power out of that instrument instantaneously. I've used them since 1980. Um, um, 86, 87. D-tuners? Yeah, because we, we had that song Wait, and I recorded in the studio, and I think we had a Kubiki Factor bass back then. It had a little lever on it that wasn't clean to use, but so when uh, when I found out about the hip shot um, unit, it's just been on all my bases, so I was like, Randy, could we please? And he was like, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll get yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So are, are these your pedals down here? Is this part of your typical line? That's my, uh, that's my signature pedal, and that's a that's a hyperdrive distortion that I developed with um, with Ashdown upstairs, and um, that's a, that's something I've been trying. I'm a little like Randy in that you know I'm, I'm kind of never really satisfied with the status quo. I always have a different idea that might be you know something that would really appeal to me. So what I've been trying to do is get a, a sweep filter. Um, uh, distortion for bass where you can put the sweep in front of the distortion and selectively choose exactly where it starts to peak and uh, it has a beauty that's got a balance control in it so you can actually bring in the sound of the bass along with it which I've, I was doing that in different ways with different distortion units and wah-wah pedals and all that stuff and just kind of put it all in one box I'm very proud of that 
And so what is, what is your current live rig right now, and how is the new bass responding to it? Well, I haven't actually gotten, because we've been off tour for uh, throughout Christmas, and you know, but um, it will respond gorgeously. Yes. I can, no, I can tell you this. I was just upstairs. I use Ashdown equipment, which are great amps. I've been using it for over 10 years, and to me, sonically, they're the strongest, most powerful, most articulate amplifiers you can get. Um, so I've been using their ABM systems. I'll throw a plug in, though, because I did plug this into the new tube system, which is a 427, all tubes, front end, back end, and that, it was absolutely terrifying. As a matter of fact, there's a... There's, there's in a, a good way. It, right. Yeah, well... It, we Formed always, and terrifying. It's metal talk. Just stay with me on this, okay? Um, so terrifying, scary, bloody, it was all, you know, metallic. That's good, yeah. right? Brutal. Brutal. Yeah. brutal. Well, so brutal, in fact, that the guy who worked for Rashdown had to excuse himself and... and well, he, was, he went to the men's room for a while, but not because I was playing, but just because you know, it was his time. He hit the brown note. Yeah, but he came out and he said, okay, not only did it loosen my bowels, but that's 120 yards away. And it was shaking the whole room. This is on the floor upstairs. So wow. I think the combination, but I mean, the bass was obviously feeding it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>